is recorded uh, from actual um, conversations that happened on 9-11. Now, this past week, we remember, we remembered what happened on 9-11. Most of us were alive back then. Most of us probably remember where we are, were and what we were doing when uh, that event took place. This footage was put together by Fox 17 here in Nashville. And uh, I actually couldn't find it on their website, but April Chapley posted it on her Facebook page. And so that's where I went to get it. So um, I want you to listen and uh, I want you to remember. And then we're going to talk a little bit about it. There are <clears throat> a number of lessons that we could learn from 9-11, but I think one of the most important for us is that we do not know what is going to happen any day of our lives. No person got up that morning thinking that any of that would take place. No person got up thinking, this is the last day of my life, or I'm going to be stuck on a hijacked plane, or I'm going to be in a tower and I can't get out. What we need to remember is what the Bible tells us in James chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city. Spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 34, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. One lesson 9-11 should teach us is that because of that reality, we should always be prepared. Um, it happens not just on 9-11, 2001, for Sheila's parents, it happened one evening on a road that they had traveled many times in the years that they were alive. And I'm sure they had traveled on it many times in the rain. But that particular night, they didn't count on two 18-wheelers pulling out in front of them. The first one threw them into the second one. My dad worked in the Garden, and actually, I guess you would call it the fields, because it was bigger than most people's gardens. My dad went out, worked in the fields one day, came home and went to bed, not knowing that that would be his last day alive. <clears throat> My mom had an operation, not knowing that she would wake up on a ventilator and never leave the hospital two and a half months later, she died. We don't know. We just don't know what our lives are going to be like. And that's why it's important because, see, here's what usually happens. We get up and we don't take any thought about the day. It's just going to be another day. We get up and we eat. Well, I eat my oatmeal. I don't know what you eat. Uh, 
She eats her Danish. Uh, we get up, we get dressed, we get out, and our day begins, and we have no clue what's going to happen after that. In fact, we're not, <laughs> we're not even sure we're going to be doing that that morning. How do, you, how do you prepare? How do you live your life in such a way that you're always ready to go? Well, um, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter with me. And for a few moments, we're just going to talk about that. First Peter chapter 1, and we'll begin with verse 13. First Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges, judges each man's work impartially, Live your lives as strangers here in, the, in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last days for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. <clears throat> the figure of speech uh, that we find in verse 13, uh, prepare your minds for action, is literally gird up your, the loins of your mind. Now, in the ancient times, men didn't wear trousers. They wore robes. And when they had to fight or run or work, what they would do is they would reach down and pull that robe up between their legs and tie it around their waist so that they wouldn't be in the way and they would have the mobility to do whatever they needed to do. That's what Elijah did when he ran from Mount Carmel all the way back uh, in the rain. He girded up his loins. That's what Elisha's servant Gehaziel did when he had to run <clears throat> for, on an errand with Elisha's command to uh, help a boy who was dying. So what he's talking about here is preparing for what comes, preparing for action. And he begins by saying, therefore. And of course, when I was in college, um, my Bible teacher always told us when we saw a therefore to ask what it was there for. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. The therefore points back to what he has previously told us. And I want to focus on verses 3 through 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance that can never perish soil or fade kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Notice we have these great blessings. We 
because of his great mercy, have a new birth, <clears throat> a new life. And this new life has given us a living hope because we know that our Savior, Jesus Christ, was raised from the dead. And because he lives, we will too. That's right. This inheritance cannot be taken away. Nothing can ruin it. It is there for us, kept in heaven. And through faith, we are shielded by God's power. I love Psalm 34. The angel of the Lord encamps round about those who, who fear him. And he delivers them. Angels are ministering spirits, Hebrews tells us, sent forth to minister to those who will inherit eternal life. So God has appointed his angels as our guardians, our keepers. And we are shielded by God's power. Isn't that nice to know? <laughs> you need a shield sometimes? I do a lot. Unto the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. There is a a full salvation. We've, we've begun experiencing salvation, but it hasn't been completed yet, has it? But it's coming. It's coming. Because of these realities, because we know what we have, because we know where we're headed, and because we know that if we trust God, nothing can touch us that he doesn't allow we can live our lives with confidence each and every day. We don't know what's going to happen, <clears throat> but we don't have to be afraid of what's going to happen because we have a God who's watching over us. He also says, not only prepare your minds for action, uh, this uh, be sober is translated in the NIV, be self-controlled. And uh, that's a good way to translate it uh, because we need to be clear-minded. I've, I've entitled this message, Sober Living in a Senseless Age. And we do live in a senseless age, an age where people just don't know what they're doing. They don't know where they're going and they don't know how to live. But we know how to live. There are two other times that Peter uses be sober in this book, in this little letter. In chapter 4, verse 7, he says, be clear-minded or sober and be self-controlled so that you can pray. You know, if we're not clear-minded... And, and, and under control, we really can't pray the way we need to. And it also says in chapter 5, verse 8, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We need to be clear-minded and alert because we have an enemy. And that enemy comes against us when we least expect it. Again, he says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. You know better. You know how to live now. You know better than to live like you used to live. God has called us to holiness <clears throat> Holiness means to be separated to God and away from the things that displease God. Now, you can't do that on your own, can you? Probably tried. You've probably tried to be a good person, and you probably will confess, honestly, that you were unsuccessful <laughs> in what you tried. But you tried it. That's the problem. God calls us to be holy, but he wants to help us 
to be holy. And he can do what we can't. Billy Graham said, the effective Christians of history have been men and women of great personal discipline, mental discipline, discipline of the body, discipline of the tongue, and discipline of the emotions. And we have to ask God for the ability to be self-controlled. Now, for those of you who are in my Wednesday evening Holy Spirit class, where does self-control come from? It is a, a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is, a, it is a, an outworking of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. So you can be self-controlled if you depend on the Holy Spirit to help you. And this, this challenge to be holy is, is very challenging. Um, I found this in my Life Application Bible. Who wants to be holy? Holiness is a tough sell for pastors, teachers, and youth leaders to make today. Who really wants to be holy? In most people's minds, holiness stands for moral superiority, a judgmental spirit, and non-participation in the world's pleasures. How can we pers persuade, <clears throat> excuse me, how can we persuade reticent readers of 1 Peter that they should be holy? Most churches don't teach separation from sin. If we did so, we'd have to eliminate a lot of the activities we're involved in. Uh, a lot of TV, a lot of movies would have to go. We'd have to stay away from professional sporting events where people get drunk and there's foul language. We'd have to purge our desires for the world's goods and pleasures. Where do you draw the line? Wouldn't we then become hypocrites? Yes, it's a, a tough sell to make. If it were merely Peter or Pastor Smith or Pastor Dan who was doing the promoting, well... But Christ himself told us to be holy. He said, in the same way, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. So we should be holy because we love our holy Lord. If that doesn't motivate us, we should also remember that we'll be judged Live according to God's standards, not the world's standards. And we need to do this every day. We need to pursue holiness. We need to pursue right living. We need to pursue a, an alertness in our lives. Why? Well, because we love the Lord. but also because we don't know when we'll take our last breath. We don't know what this day will bring forth. This day isn't over, and we don't know what's going to happen. I'm not trying to frighten you, you, but you know this. You know this reality. We want to avoid it. We want to push it aside. We don't want to think about it. But it is the truth. We don't know what's going to happen. And so the best thing that we can do is to be prepared.